Hello, welcome to this video. And on this video, I'm going to be going through what I think are the 10 worst albums ever made. Um, now, what criteria am I using for this? Well, you know, there's a million albums out there that are just merely boring, right? And I think that is possibly the worst album you could ever make. All the uh, albums on this are at least interesting in the fact that they are so abysmal. So boring albums don't get on the list. Um, there's also, with the uh, rise of the internet and the lack of um, quality control that record companies brought to music, a whole host of really awful bands out there churning their awful derivative rubbish out. And so really, I'm sure the worst albums exist in the... Um, esoteric ether of the internet hidden away you know where they should be so one of the criteria i've used for this list is uh, artists that should know better there are some legends on this list and it's good to be able to show that these people were mortal and although they'd achieved great success in some cases legendary success they were still capable of being self-indulgent or just artistically go going down the wrong um, aesthetic route. So um, I'm going to kick straight in. I won't go on too much. Um, I've got my list here. So um, at number 10, I have Elvis Presley and the album in question is Frankie and Johnny. Now, if I just said Elvis Presley, you may have thought I was going to go for Having Fun on Stage, which was an album made in 1974 at the behest of... Um, Elvis's autocratic manager, Colonel Tom Parker, he realised that if he wasn't putting out songs that were published by the record company RCA, that he thought he could grab 100% of the royalties. So he decided to edit together the bits in between the songs from live performances, where Elvis is basically humming tunes, uh, cracking bad jokes or jokes that are out of context don't make sense, um, talking about the band members, and in some case he's telling quite interesting stories about his early career um i don't think this album's that bad actually it is what it is uh, the worst thing about it is the cash grab of um, his manager but it's it evidences that very well um the quality isn't that great um you can go and listen to it but for me it is what it is and if you're a hardcore elvis fan you may have found some interest in hearing him talk out of context is that make quite makes sense there's a lot of things where, where he's obviously doing visual stuff so people are laughing but we don't actually know what's going on but there are a few little interesting nuggets in there about him going and recording his first records and stuff like that and uh, and it does show elvis to have a sense of humor i don't think it's that bad but as we all know elvis presley who is the embodiment of rock and roll for many people, Is who is worshipped as a god by many people, or was when I was a kid, the king of rock and roll, um, we know that he was pulled down by the fact of the magic that made him so successful. Okay, so um, I can remember chatting to my friend Kevin Gammon, and he was talking to someone, and he relayed a story of someone who saw... Elvis Presley, back in 1954, 55, before he was famous, Elvis was going around playing um, fairgrounds, you know, fairs and things like this, They were where they would pull up a, a, a sort of a lorry or, you know, a flatbed lorry, and he'd get on the back of there and start performing. And he said, as soon as he got on stage, people were running home and grabbing their family and bringing them back down. People could not believe what they were seeing. Now, um, there's those out there that say Elvis Presley was the sort of... Um, the whitification, I suppose, of um, American rhythm and blues. But um, he came from that part of the world. He, he was part of that culture, and he rep represented the fusion of American rhythm and blues, which he'd grown up with and loved, with country music, and that is the key to rock and roll. But that combined with his incredible good looks and his charisma and his ability to perform in an electrifying way uh, made him absolutely unique. Of course, that sort of charisma was ideal for the film industry, the Hollywood film industry, which was in its death throes at that point. Um, and so Elvis was pulled into a sort of um, series of studio system films at a time where filmmaking was moving towards something much more edgier, you know. So um, as filmmakers were building up to make, you know, films like 
easy rider in the late 60s elvis was ensconced in the production of a series of pretty abysmal um, films trading on on his fame uh, in 1966, uh, he made a film called Frankie and Johnny. Of course, there's music in there. Of course, he sings on it. And this film, which is set at the sort of turn of the 19th, 20th century, is set in um, an era which is evoked by the use of ragtime, Dixieland jazz, and in some cases, a gypsy music. But this being a Hollywood film, it is awful Hollywood examples of that music made worse. It's got Elvis Presley singing on them. And to hear Elvis in this context as you see how low he'd go. Of course, a few years later, he would do the comeback show and he would he would have that one triumphant return. But this is the embodiment of Elvis at his worst. And it's such a shame to hear. Um, I get the feeling at this time that Elvis didn't want to sing this stuff. And uh, though he was a fantastic singer, you can hear him sort of going in and throwing these songs off and getting back out. He didn't want to do it. But of course... As we all know, he had to do what Colonel Tom Parker told him to do. So that's what happened. Number 10 is um, Frankie and Johnny by Elvis Presley. At number nine, I have um, an album from the jazz rock fusion genre. As you know, if you are followers of this channel, I have done the worst jazz rock fusion albums and I have done the worst prog albums. Those lists have got some abysmal stuff on. And when I was looking into... Um, terrible jazz rock albums I unearthed some real stinkers and they have to be on this list because these are virtuoso musicians now the problem with virtuoso musicians is they're best when they're being virtuoso but if you give them a whiff of stardom they will often try and think they are now a pop star and um, try and uh, write some pop songs which is always the worst thing the musician in question is El Shanker who uh, it was the virtuoso Indian classical violinist that came to uh, prominence, at least in the West, in Shakti, which was John McLaughlin's um, band post Mavish Norkstra. Um, so incredible he was on this these, these recordings that he was then grabbed by uh, the world of rock, uh, first by Frank Zappa, then um, Peter Gabriel, David Bowie. And I think at this point... Um, El Shanker believed that he could make a bid for pop success. So he put a band together called The Epidemics and the album came out in the early 80s called Epidemics. Now, on paper, this should be an incredible album. The virtuoso El Shanker had paired up with he, um, the up-and-coming guitar player Steve Vai and, and the bass virtuoso, the fretless bass virtuoso Percy Jones. What a band! Uh, they'd been offered a deal by ECM Records. Now, ECM Records is the esoteric jazz label that is very artsy-fartsy and always never puts a foot... So it's, it's, it's the arbiter of, of taste, the cold European version of instrumental wonder. That's what ECM proffer on the market in terms of the music industry. This album comes out with a beautiful cover created by the incredible minimalist artistic team. And I saw this album... The Epidemic's cool band name, El Shanker with Steve Vai and Percy Jones on the ECM label, How Could It Go Wrong? Now, this album was hard to get a hold of when I was a kid. I had to get on the import. It cost a lot of money. And when I got it home and put it on, what, what was actually on there was a series of pop songs that had been made by him and his wife or girlfriend or whatever she was, Caroline, known as Caroline. And on this, over awful drum machine programmes, was um, El Shanker's desperate attempts to write pop songs there is actually a video that there's a pop video made and um he, he is absolutely not convincing as a pop star but you can see in his eyes he thought he was now what's interesting to me is this is the point when el shankar seems to he seems to disappear in a way to the point when shakti was reformed by john mclaughlin and the rest of the guys um in the um late 90s um, they reported that they couldn't find El Shanker. We can only assume that El Shanker had actually got, got gone up his own bottom. And the beginning of this is this album here. I, uh, I don't believe for an instant that they couldn't find him. You know, um, how hard is it to find an El Shanker? I don't know. Um, but apparently they couldn't find him, so he wasn't on that tour. But maybe he's... Um, uh, <laughs> 
maybe it was his ego that was a bit hard to control. This is what I feel. This is a gut reaction that I feel with El Shanka. Anyway, I will move on from this awful album to number eight, which is uh, Unfinished Music Number One, Two Virgins by John Lennon which was made in 1966 with Yoko Ono. So let's set the seed for this album, then let, let, let you think, and yeah, yeah, then you can make a decision of whether this was um, a, a good artistic, um, a, 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 a good artistic choice by a guy that was at that point in the biggest band in history, at the peak of their powers. So 966, he's still married to Cynthia Lennon. They're having difficulty in their marriage so John says why don't you go on holiday you can go off to Greece so off she toddles to Greece as soon as she's gone he uh, then rings up Yoko Ono who just met at an uh, exhibition and uh, entices her over to his house um, not with etchings as which is the usual way of enticing um, young ladies to your house you know but with tape loops he had assembled a bunch of tape loops when they got together they that night decided to make an album with Yoko and John warbling over these tape loops. It is best described as music concrete. But of course, John Lennon is not Stockhausen, he's not Pierre Boulez, he <laughs> is a pop star. The, and I find this pretentious, I find it um, indulgent. Of course he can do this because he's in the Beatles, the label's going to put it out. And even though he's in the biggest band in the world at that time and what has now become the biggest band of all time when this was released it didn't chart i think it went to about a number 150 or something in the uk it didn't chart in the, in the states on top of that they had the idea when this album came out which i think came out in 1968 of appearing naked on the cover so the cover has uh john lennon and yoko in in the nip starkers on the front right and this is at a time when, um, shall we say, um, personal grooming was not a thing. When you flip the album over, look at the back, you see them from behind. And uh, I've spoken about this phenomenon on the channel before. Um, if you're going to have a bottom on an album cover, make sure it's a strong bottom. If you look at Going for the One by Yes, and you look at uh, that figure, which I'm pretty sure is Patrick Moraz on, the, on, the, on that cover... At least that's a strong bottom. Whereas if you go to Hemispheres by Rush, that chap that's dancing around on top of the brain, that is not a strong bottom. And neither John or um, Yoko had a strong bottom. I don't want to see that. And of course, nobody did. And so this album was 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 like basically avoided by all the retailers and record shops. And so it had to be released in a brown paper bag, which um, in the 1950s, this was the way that um, gentlemen who were buying certain magazines under the counter would be given um, their um, purchases in a brown paper bag. It's uh, something that Led Zeppelin did far more successfully when they brought out In Through the Outdoor. But actually, you know, Lennon um, pioneered this. Now, when we look at this, um, the best thing about this is the album cover and that's saying something the music itself is just rubbish attempt at avant-garde music by somebody in a position where they can sort of do whatever they want and that's what i hear um a similar thing was done on uh, revolution number no. nine but that's interesting because it's in the context of an album and also that revolution number no. nine is much more coherent and concise in terms of the editing. This is rambly and rubbish. The only thing about it, it does have a certain English sense of humour that comes from the absurd, something that the Beatles always had in their music. But it's not enough for me. It's too self-indulgent. It's awful, and it should never see the light of day. I think they went, then went on to do two more albums in this vein. Of course they could, because he was John Lennon, he could do what he wanted. Right. Number seven, I have cut the crap by The Clash. I am of a certain age that back in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, when I was discovering the new wave of British heavy metal and then progressive rock and jazz fusion, I was a bit... Um, I wasn't following the trend of my peers at school who um, worshipped The Clash. There is a certain thing about The Clash. If you're my age, you bump into a British person of my age 
they will worship the clash um, if you go down to the local rehearsal room now it won't be full of kids trying to play rock and roll it will be full of middle-aged men trying to play music that sounds like the clash right the clash are worshipped um, um they were of course one of the uh, originators of british punk they were the middle class boys playing at being uh, working class. And because of that, the uh, establishment heaped them with the sort of real critical um, worth that they can do when their own are doing something. Uh, the Sex Pistols, who really were working class, have got portrayed thanks to the posh boy Malcolm McLaren as being the con artists when they were the real deal. OK, so I've always had a little bit of a thing with the clash, um, you know, you know, this is that it's it's not quite as genuine as everybody thinks. But that is really being harsh when they get to cut the crap, you know, at the same time, same time that John Lydon is coming out with um, the album album with public image, public image limited which is completely a work of genius and rhymes with the times of the 80s. It's one of the greatest albums of the 1980s as far as I'm concerned. Um, and, and uses the aforementioned Steve Vai in a brilliant way, unlike El Shanker was able to do. John Lydon is an absolute genius, right? And every time I mention the Sex Pistols of John Lydon, there is a, um, a contingent on my channel that come in and just rubbish them. They haven't got a clue. They don't know what they're talking about. Anyway, Clash are also fantastic and I've championed them. But... By the time they get to the mid-80s, they have become what they rebelled against, right? They're part of the establishment and they're a dinosaur band and they don't understand what is going on around them. And they think that just by grabbing a few drum machines and shouting over it and trying to bring their punk aesthetic to the modern production techniques that were around at that time, that they would somehow cut through the crap of the industry, which they just don't do. This is a horrible sounding album. It's got no redeeming features. It's not mixed well. It doesn't sound well. God knows how a band at this level could go this wrong. And I feel it was because it was indulgent and pretentious. The thing that always gets, um, you know, thrown at progressive rock. No, anybody can be indulgent and pretentious. And middle class people can be indulgent and pretentious in a way that nobody else can. And uh, that's what we have at number seven is Cut the Crap by The Clash. Right, at number um, six, I have one of my favourite bands, uh, Pantera. And we have the album from the early 80s, Metal Magic. Yes, they have been around for that long. Um, albums like Far Beyond Driven, Vulgar Display of Power, Cab Was Felt. These are genius rock albums that took thrash metal and brought in um, a sort of groove and uh, meatiness to it that the thrash metal bands never had. You know, that slow, grungy groove that Black Sabbath originally um, developed. You know, the idea of being heavy. I love Pantera. But what we have with um, Metal Magic is an absolute pile of rubbish. Now, I've got um, some, if I can just pull it up, I've got some uh, lyrics. I think this best explains how bad this album is. I don't have to say much because you are now, you know, you could see the album cover. The album cover is truly abysmal. It's one of the worst album covers in history. It looks like a bunch of teenagers that had discovered hair metal and the new wave of British hair metal and didn't know which one they were, decided to make an album. So they went down to their friend, some mulleted guy who owned, a, you know, some pencil crayons and said, can you do us an album cover and make sure there's a lot of chrome effect? Because, of course, in the early 80s, you know, if you make an album, it has to have chrome effect. Look at Axe Attack, Metal for Mothers. Everything has to have a chrome effect. But this is the worst example of a chrome effect on a heavy metal the worst cliche ever anyway right that album cover is awful now i'm going to go to a song on this album called um ride my rocket and i'm going to read the lyrics out to you and it will give you an idea of how bad this album is right in this day and time of metal magic we need rock and roll right and Pantera are the ones that are going to give you... They're going to bring rock and roll back to this era of metal magic that emerged in the early 80s. Fair enough. We need Pantera. They are Pantera. So they basically say they need themselves, unless they're talking from the point of view of their audience, which is a bit arrogant. But it's not that bad. You know, many bands boast like this. Um, then the, uh, the, the song goes down another avenue. 
I didn't want to touch you. This is the song now. This is not me just saying that, you know. Um, I didn't want to touch you since we were both 16. I didn't want to take you down and show you what love means. Now is the time. This is the place. Get ready to take a chance. We don't have a minute to waste. Well, that as a lyric doesn't make sense because whatever he's going to do well we know what he's going to do he's going to show show her what love means but when he shows her what love means he says he can't do it and then he says he is going to do it which is very very strange especially at someone who is only 16 years old the whole thing is just suspect then we get to the chorus ride my rocket wear me out ride my rocket make me twist and shout ride my rocket give me all your love ride my rocket i just can't get enough right there's a little there's a little um, prod to the beatles there you'd never expect that from pantera would you on an album i i, I could give you the whole you want a whole song i can keep going if you want um, i don't even think i need to critique this it's 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 uh, apparent um people say that art is um subjective right so no this is objectively bad isn't it <laughs> um where we where were we I just can't get enough. You leave me breathless. When you walk by, the way you move it, girl, makes you satisfied. This doesn't even make sense. You might be the best that I've ever had. It's got to be good, girl, because it looks so bad. Ride my rocket, wear me out. Ride my rocket, make me twist and shout. Right. It goes on like this. And at that point, they just start to say, ride my rocket, wear me out, over and over again. Ad infinitum to the end of the track. I rest my case. It's truly awful, Pantera. What the hell were you doing? I can't believe that this was not held against you in later life and that you've got away with nobody bringing this album up. It is truly awful. Right, what do we have at number five? Right, this is an album by uh, the actor Corey Feldman, um, who was a child actor in such classics as Stand By Me, Gremlins, um, and uh, what else was he in? Oh, I've got to talk about Corey Feldman. I'm right at the limits of my knowledge, you know. So Corey Feldman was this, you know, child star. You know, he uh, is basically, it seems like he had his head done in by all the abuse of the Hollywood system that was heaped upon uh, child stars at that time. You know, he is an alleged uh, um, abuse from Michael Jackson. There's a whole host of horrible things going on there. But Corey Feldman, he's like one of those guys you just can't let go, can he? Now, um, at some point, I think around in the 2000s, I'm not too sure. It could have been quite recently. I don't even know what the... Well, have, I got, have I put the date of this album on? It's relatively recently. Corey Feldman, after a trip to Hugh Hefner's um, Playboy Mansion, had noticed there that there was a lot of young girls that needed his help. They needed his help in... Um, access in the music industry because they couldn't access they needed they needed someone who knew knows the ropes like Corey Feldman so Corey Feldman decided to form a thing called Corey's Angels where we would help these helpless young ladies that he'd found at uh, the Playboy Mansion on top of that he decided then to make a concept album about these Corey's Angels, in which he would be like that voice, Charlie, you know, in the Charlie's Angels, the one that comes out and says their missions, and intersperse that with a, a series of songs. Now, these songs are absolutely awful. Corey Feldman has no idea what makes a pop song. They're badly recorded, they're mixed and they're harsh, and then it's interspersed with these bits in between that... Uh, as bad as the album, this is an unlistable album, angelic to the core, right? Um, it's it's low hanging fruit, I think, to go find somebody who's not necessarily a, a musician or pop star, and um, and look at the albums they make because they're usually abysmal. But this has something that which is even worse. This idea of Corey's Angels, I find just distasteful in the extreme especially when it's somebody who shouted about abuse as Corey Feldman has. Um, there is nothing redeeming about this. It leaves a nasty taste in the mouth. <laughs> and there's a joke there, but I'll let you have I'll let you make that one up and I will move on. 
to number four. Right, I think on number four, I've discovered the worst um, music act in history. So at number four, I have any album by the rap group Broken Side or Broken Side. Broken Side. Broken Side is the worst thing I've ever heard in my life. I've got to be honest. Um, and I tried to get through their albums to try and find out which the worst one was. But they live. They they produce a level of awfulness, which is hard to distinguish because when you listen to this music, you automatically look away. You you can't focus on it, right? Um, they are the purveyors of a style of music called crunk core, which has been described as um, the cross between Slipknot and Cher. Um, that is giving it too much credit it's it, it, it's um i don't know it's basically them shouting it's these sort of what sound like indulged you know privileged spoilt teenagers shouting over awful programmed hip-hop beats the reason why i broke broken side in here because i think in 2006 when they formed this is the seed that has impregnated the music industry as we know it and is is um it, it's like the concentrated vile virus that has got into the music industry to make it so truly awful right these guys just shout horrible obscenities over awfully programmed drum beats and then they've mixed it so harshly. They've compressed it as loud as it possibly can. You can't listen to it for too long because it's harsh on the ears. While they scream at you about the most offensive things. And it just comes up as sort of spoiled teenagers shouting because they can. All right. One of the big factors on this list for me is this idea of people in a position of privilege um embodying that in the music the spoilt brattishness of this band is horrible and i'm sure there's some sort of postmodern take on this where um it's supposed to be a joke and they probably thought it was very funny to write songs like this i won't go on about what they sing about it's just truly awful any of these albums could be at number four you can pick which one you want um if you are are interested in finding out about them you can go and google them and have a listen to them but it is really not worth your time this is crud and um if the uh, last three that i'm about to cover weren't so funny this would probably be on the top of the list but there is a charm to these top three because they are so truly awful this is of course the um, enigma of the awful to good circle you know so you start with brilliant music and you start to move back to like quite good music mediocre average pretty bad really bad broken side and then when you push past into this area where these last three exist you're almost like dealing with masterpieces right and on this list they these guys uh, managed to pull off something that Corey Feldman couldn't Corey Feldman's is just turgid and unlistenable and and nasty these albums do have a charm. Well, do they? I don't know. The next one definitely does. The next one could well be the greatest album ever made. I'm not too sure. And this is why it resides at number three. And it is an album made by Hulk Hogan called Hulk Rules. And on this album, he basically traverses a whole bunch of different music styles. Um in some places completely incompetently and in other places quite competently the rock on here is not too bad but he also raps and he attempts pop music and he even tries some ballads now i want to draw your attention to one of these ballads and i've had to write this down because i can't remember this stuff right so on this album exists a song which is possibly the worst song in history and it's called hulkster in heaven now a hulkster is a fan of the Hulk and one of his fans died of leukemia and he wrote this song for that fan and it's called Hulkster in Heaven I'm going to read you uh, some of the lyrics here because it's the best way of explaining what this is like of course it's Hulk Hogan singing sort of a very emotional ballad so if you can imagine that right because you don't want to listen to it just imagine it 
whatever you imagine will not be as bad as what it actually is. I tell you that now. Verse one. I read it in the papers. I saw it on TV. I guess there'll be one empty seat when I wrestle at Wembley. I used to tear my shirt, but now you've torn my heart. I knew that you were a Hulkamaniac right from the very start. And then backing vocals, right from the very start. Chorus, you were my friend. You were my friend. I'll see you again. This is not the end. When the Hulkster comes to heaven, heaven, heaven. Oh, so the Hulkster is not the name of his family. It's the Hulkamaniacs. I'm sorry, I've got it a bit wrong. I've realised reading this out loud that I've got the concept. That the Hulkster is him, isn't it? So he's talking about himself in heaven. Oh, this is makes it worse. So Hulk Hogan is saying at some point you'll be heaven and you'll be able to meet up with his fan who died of leukemia. This is real. This, this really happened. I wish Hulk's love could bring you back again. You are my friend, you are my friend, and I'll see you again, I'll see you again. Verse 2. When I climb back in the ring, I know we'll win this fight. I wish you were here at the ring site to cheer me on tonight. The spotlight now grows dim, and now it's not on me. The prayers we've said together are still our guarantee. And then it's the chorus again. Um, this album uh, is loved by people all over the world. And I'll, I've got some reviews here off Amazon. Um, somebody has said, the Hulk, the Hulkster has created this gen generation's dark side of the moon. Without a doubt, he has. Someone else, probably the best album I ever owned, Hulk. Hogan's sage and evangelical advice provided through the medium of song has changed my life. I want to be a Hulkamaniac displays Culkin's ability to communicate the issues that deeply affect today's society. His delivery is unsurpassed by any other musician. His warnings about drugs and the importance of education and family are more than relevant in today's society. <laughs> Don't let this review deceive you to think Hogan's music is confined to one genre. Hogan foray, Hogan's forays into rap, rock, country demonstrate, demonstrated on Hawkster's back, American Maid and the wrestling boot travelling band respectively should not be underestimated one of my work colleagues on upon listening to this sublime flowing ballad that is hawks in heaven commented that i choked and began to uncontrollably weep at my desk but these were not tears of grief they were tears of joy that this most pure and beautiful song i'd ever had the pleasure of, that I'd ever had the pleasure of listening to, right? It just goes on and on. There's loads of these, loads of these. This album is a collection of musical beauty. When pushing this foray into the musical world of the Hawkster, upon recommendation of my, my friend, I bet it's the same guy, whose musical taste I have never doubted, I have to say, I was slightly dubious, but, but upon listening, this disappointment was not what I had. <laughs> But I have to ask, how can an artist capable of adapting to so many different genres of music from 80s um, guitar synth, Hulk's the one, to gentle country, wrestling boot travelling band, possibly be ridden to the bargain bins of service stations up and down the country? I'll never know, right? I'm not reading these great. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it's what happens when you get to my age. It's like I, I, I've got um, these, these glasses. Are, they're, they're trifocals, these glasses. And if I haven't got something in exactly the right place i can't right read it but uh, i think you get the gist um yeah, so it could well be one of the great albums ever made um, i put it on and it, i found it completely awful but anyway we will move on to number two right when i did my 10 most important bands in music history there were a number of bands that people said should have been on the list pink floyd was one of them um, ironically, I on the following video, I had uh, pointed out that um, there's a certain type of person that will basically put a comment that, because that, that can be boiled down into just two words. Pink Floyd, question mark. So two words and then uh, uh, whatever you call that. Um, what are they called? Um, what are they called? Like commas and full stops and question marks and exclamation. They've got a name, haven't they? They've got a collective name. Anyway... 
People thought Pink Floyd should have been on the list. They were wrong. Uh, but the one that came up as well was the Beach Boys. Now, I think they're overestimating the Beach Boys because for some reason Pet Sounds has gone down history and been one of the most important albums ever made in the history of mankind, which I don't think it was. Now, I think it was quite an important album back in 1966. But, you know, um, but people seem to think that. Um, before that, they were, they were a cool, like, sort of barbershop pop band that, you know, happened to, before you know british people came out and showed the americans actually how to rock you know they, they they were an interesting little band um good vibrations one of the greatest songs ever written they are a great band right and maybe they should have got on the list maybe i was wrong but the reason i didn't put you on the list is because they made an album called summer in paradise which came out in 1992 it's on number two in my list i put this album on it is just absolute rubbish right now, of course, you know, you've got Brian Wilson version of the Beach Boys and he's obviously, you know, an insane genius, as we know. But when Mike Love gets control, it just turns into pap. And this album is the best example of pap ever going. The album cover is actually quite nice. And we, we and you look at that, you think, well, maybe the Beach Boys are going to do bring their their signature sound to the, the, the troubles that are happening out in nature you know, climate change and all the horrible stuff that's been, been done to the animals and the sea, you know. Uh, and I think they're trying to do that in, on this album. But it's not like that. It's awful. 80s production back in 92. If this had been, been done in 1982, it would be truly awful. They are totally out of date. They come in and it's so self-referential that they have to keep harking back to their past triumphs on an album where... They attempt to rap. It's just the worst thing I've ever heard in my life. I do think this is absolutely... No, there's one thing that's worse. It's the album that's number one. This is absolutely rubbish. I have got a little sample of the lyrics. There's a track on there called Summer of Love. So in 1992, here they are trying to, um, you know, point you back to the Summer of Love in 1967, which they're trying to pretend that they were a part of. Unless... The worst scenario is it's the summer of Mike Love, which I think is might be what they mean. I've only got a, one sample of this lyric, and it's just terrible. Uh, so this is what they sing in the the song "Summer of Love," which, if we take the interpretation that it's, it's the summer of Mike Love, is just awful. People all around the world in every nation. Let's get together for some excitations. Excitation is, of course, a word that they invented and utilised in the, the track Good Vibrations. So when they do this, they're like going, you know, we, we use the term excitation. We're supposed to get all excited about that. Right, so I'll start again. I'll re read the whole thing again because it's only, I'm only, I couldn't bring myself to bring out any more than just this one verse, right? People all the, around the world in every nation Let's get together for some excitations. Fair enough. If you're a girl that, appre <laughs> that appreciates her recreations, why don't you let me take you on a love vacation? Ladies out there, does that sound enticing? Rubbish. So what have we got at number one? It's an album I've, I, that made my number one of the worst jazz rock fusion albums. And it is the album, of course it is, the worst album ever made. Space Jazz by L. Ron Hubbard, right? Scientology is terrible. You can't even laugh at Scientology, right? It's just an awful thing. We all know it's an awful thing. You know, it, this cod stupid religion that seems to be propped up by a whole bunch of dodgy film stars that extract money from the rich and famous, you know, whilst they have some sort of secret coalition out there that is out there to destroy anybody that questions this awful dogmatic trot crap that the Scientology is, you know, created by this bogus, you know, snake oil, you know, um, twat called L. Ron Hubbard, you know. Um, go and check out my interview with Scott Henderson. Uh, Scott Henderson was the guitarist in Chick Corea's electric band, and Chick Corea was uh, a Scientologist, of course. And um, he couldn't take it, you know. This is a cult. It's the biggest cult in the world, you know. So, 
in uh, I think around about 1982, Chick Corea, who at this point had, had, had acquired um, either a Fairlight or a Synclavier, one of those early sampling systems which they thought could recreate orchestras and brass sections, was brought in by L. Ron Hubbard to make an album called Space Jazz. Um, if you really want to, to hear about this, I go into it um, at length on a video called The Worst Jazz Rock Fusion Albums of All Time. And worse than this, poor old Stanley Clark, who was also a Scientologist uh, back then. I don't know if he is now. I don't think he is. I, I, I have not detected that in his music recently. There was a certain point um, where S Stanley Clark's album went from being turgid trite to be absolutely brilliant. Suddenly he came back. And I guess, and I've got no backup to prove this, but I think it's because he's split from Scientology. That's what I think happened at a certain point. But Chick Corea, Corea never did. But back then, Stanley Clark and Chick Corea, two of the greatest jazz rock fusion musicians of all time, made an album called Space Jazz with L. Ron Hubbard, and it is truly rubbish. And that is what I have at number one on my list so i've got to the end of this one i didn't want to make it too long it's 40 minutes long you know i go on um as you could see i am testing out my new equipment that has been bought for me by my lovely patrons and for my lovely viewers that drop a little bit of money in my paypal tip jar you know so you viewers have been able to up the quality and i've been experimenting with it recently just to um to, to try and see how, how to do it. Because I don't know how to do any of this. I'm making it up. So that's why I'm in a different uh, location. Because I'm, I'm used lighting, natural light. But I also have my light that I've bought. And I've got this microphone. So you know, no longer have to put up with the awful sound that I had. So um, my attempt of quality may have made no difference whatsoever. And I do have this feeling underneath it all that quality is probably the worst idea ever to be brought into the realm of the of art right and because uh, the real bad quality is what we've described here on this channel over the last 40 minutes and it's um it's when people go wrong <laughs> it's not about it's not about how well it's recorded is it it's all about what you're actually trying to say it's what it's about that's what it's that's what it's about anyway Got to the end of the video. If you liked it, please put a like on the video. If you want to see some more, you can subscribe. And like I said, if you want to support me in buying stuff like this to try and make the channel better, uh, then please do that. Uh, you can do that by becoming a Patreon. And then we have so much fun over at Patreon. We have meetings. We got get we get together. We now got a Discord group, so we can go in there and chat. You know, um, I create all sorts of different content articles video all sorts of stuff um so if you want to come and sample more of that stuff and join the community that's there there's some lovely people in there really knowledgeable about music and it's always lovely on a friday to get together with them on zoom and have a chat uh, but if you haven't got the time to do that then please you know if you could drop a little bit of money into my paypal tip jar if you appreciate what i'm doing because uh, it's really helping the channel and um, obviously the more I can do this the better it is for me because I love doing these videos so we've got to the end of the video okay thanks for watching this one and I'll see you on the next one